Welcome everyone. Thank you again for joining us here today. The title of our presentation is Ghost Notes, The Missing Songbirds of Trinidad and Tobago, presented by Faraz Abdul and us here at Nature Nature. Now, Nature Nature is represented today by myself, Lauren Ali, and my co-campaign manager, Neve Vaughan, and our campaign director, Mark Gibson. So I am about to lock off the poll. And let's talk about the bullfinch names. Okay, so as you guys may have heard us say, we chose this poll because it displays the variety of cultures and subcultures across which the chestnut-bellied seed finch, locally known in Trinidad and Tobago as the bullfinch, is appreciated. So what are, what are the names? All right, so in Guyana, the bird is commonly known as the Toa Toa, so that one is in fact a real name. And unfortunately, the name that most of you guys picked, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to mutilate the pronunciation, um, Zwart Kok Zedkraker is actually a real name that this bird goes by in Suriname. Chicky Chong is a name used in TNT, but also in Guyana and perhaps throughout the diaspora as well. And Picolette's also a real name. And Picolette is used occasionally in Brazil. Curio is also used in Brazil. The fake name is actually Dom Faf. Uh, we got Dom Faf by just putting um, the word bullfinch into Google Translate directly into Portuguese. We chose Portuguese because the bullfinch is really popular in Brazil. Um, but yeah, Dom Faf was the fake. Zawad Kok Zed Cracker was in fact real. So you guys should now be able to actually see those poll results. So the downside of these birds being appreciated across such a wide range is that they get trafficked. The songbird trade is actually a pretty harmful trade. And it is just diverse and international. It spreads on all around the world. It's very popular in Southeast Asia and is extensive in the Caribbean and through South America and in diaspora communities like in New York City and the Netherlands. So why is this bad? Well, it's because the songbird trade is rife with illegal and unethical activities. The birds are poached and smuggled and the conditions that they're transported in are equivalent to animal abuse. We'll be hearing a little bit more about that pretty soon. But it's bad, like in the Southeast Asian songbird keeping culture, they have been compared to cut flowers meaning that they're beautiful, but you don't expect them to last very long. And of course, this trade also creates risk to ecosystem because you've got just birds being traded left and right and they bring disease risk because there are no proper quarantine procedures for trafficked animals. And what we're here to talk about today, which is missing birds, the fact that they are being removed en masse from their natural ecosystems. Now, this is a brutal trade in Trinidad and Tobago. Here we can actually see footage from an illegal wildlife warehouse in TNT, which was provided anonymously to Nutinatia. And the birds are pretty uncomfortable, as you're about to see. <laughs> That cage is dirty, it's crowded, there is food underneath perches, which leads to things like risk of defecation into the food source, which of course is just asking for disease to happen. It's not great to be stored in an illegal wildlife warehouse. Yeah. Uh, again, sorry about that. There we go. Now, before the birds even get to Trinidad and Tobago, they face high mortality and trafficking. This photo that you see here was taken by the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard and published last year in The Guardian. Now, what it's actually showing you is drowned songbirds. 
Now, what likely happened here is that when the Coast Guard began to approach the boat with the traffickers and the smuggled animals in it, the traffickers would have tossed their cargo overboard because you know, if you don't have contraband on you, what are they gonna do? Except then of course, the poor birds just drown in the sea. So we have a situation where the birds are actually coming from Venezuela, 200 in a 12 by 12 cage. They're just in, it's just overcrowded. It's as said by the person we interviewed, an anonymous bull, bullfinch keeper, that is madness. So even the ones that don't get drowned at sea are still coming in just abusive conditions where they could die and often do. As we see here in this next quote from another anonymous bullfinch keeper that was interviewed by Nature Nature, the survival rate is probably 50-50, if not less. A lot of birds die, that's normal. So here to tell you more about the songbirds of TNT that suffer trafficking, and what we can do to improve the situation is our presenter Faraz Abdul, and he's an Audubon Society recognized wildlife photographer, author of the book Casual Birding in Trinidad and Tobago, and a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Bird Status and Distribution Committee. So Faraz is going to take over from me now as I stop sharing my screen and he begins to share his. Thank you for the introduction, Lauren. Um, let me just see. If I can get my screen up, there we go. You all should be seeing my screen right now. Yep. Okay, great. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, first of all, Lauren, and for the opportunity to present on this very pertinent issue. Okay, so here what we're looking at is, an is a very expansive habitat that formerly was home to some very special birds. But um, before I get started, Let's just take, oops, let's just take a listen to this track. Beautiful, isn't it? Imagine hearing this all of this all of the time when you look at this beautiful sunset. And what happens is that this is what you're hearing now. All right. And I said formally just now because these birds are essentially gone from the landscape. What you just heard were nine species of seed eaters native to Trinidad and Tobago. All right. Gradually. Over the course of a few decades, this music has been replaced by a deafening silence, right? Apart from this, uh, let's touch on the birds themselves. With their disappearance, we've also lost the opportunity to find out about them. Because, you know, like, just as we have our own Trini dialect, so too do many animals have their own dialects, especially specific to locality, right? So very often this may indicate a genetically separate population. Historically, we've had nine species, as I said, of seed eaters um, recorded for this country. And when I say historically, let me outline briefly the history of ornithology in Trinidad and Tobago. The first notable contribution to local ornithology was made by Taylor in 1864 and Leoto in 1866. Subsequent to those, there have been many scientists, researchers, and bird enthusiasts who study the wide variety of birds on our tiny islands. So yeah, so here we go about the birds and according to the scientific literature, we have, we're looking here at three species, right? And these three species were uncommon to rare more than a hundred years ago. You see, all birds cannot have the same population status. Some will naturally be common, others uncommon. Uh, none of these three have been seen in Trinidad and Tobago for many years. Uh, the two that we have on the left here, right? Uh, which are lesson seed eater and lion seed eater, they might look very similar and that's no, no trick of your eyes, right? They were formerly conspecific, aka they were considered the same species. Both of these species were formerly locally common on Trinidad, Tobago and uh, down the islands, right? 
um, but any sightings now are of migrants from mainland South America. On the right hand side, you see the gray seed eater, which was formerly a very common resident of Trinidad, now totally extirpated. And when I say extirpated, what I'm saying is it's locally extinct. On these, this uh, last three, right, the, the bird on the left is the yellow-bellied seed eater. That, along with the ruddy-breasted seed eater, both of them were formerly common across Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, the yellow-bellied seed eater was also common down the islands as well, the Bocas Islands. Now you can find them very, very rarely in isolated populations. The one on the right, which is your chestnut-bellied seed finch, was formerly widespread on Trinidad but it's now currently extirpated, right? And this is according to the scientific literature. This is not just some random man on the screen telling you this, okay? So we have to ask ourselves, where did they go? Because we've established that they existed and now they don't exist. So what's a link? What really happened to these seed eaters? So surely the alarms are sounding low from long before 1973, all right? But this is the date of the publication of the first authoritative book on the birds of Trinidad and Tobago, right? And this book is a guide to the birds of Trinidad and Tobago by Richard French, right? And in that book, uh, there were several notes on what is going on with the native seed eaters, right? And yeah, if you look on the bottom, that's my book. It's available, it's available on Amazon. Check it out, Casual Birding in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, moving on. Shameless plug there from, on my part. You're welcome. Um, so yeah, so the, here we're looking at a note right under what, uh, what is called the most popular of the small finches, which is a gray seed eater or picoplat, right? Now, although the species did not go extinct within a decade, right, as they're saying here, they eventually did in the following years. The species being referred to as least likely to suffer local extinction was the ruddy-breasted seed eater, what we call robin. However, in the years following this publication, the populations of the gray seed eater, the chest and bellied seed finch, and others became scarce, right? After that happened, the trappers then began targeting the ubiquitous ruddy-breasted seed eater. And now, well, I don't have to spell the rest out for you, right? Right, we just spoke about that. Moving on to 1984, right? This is an excerpt from Trinidad Naturalist Magazine. Uh, this is a March-April issue, right? And Ooh, let me try to summarize what's going on here. Okay, so think about it. It's a mid 80s. We have naturalists and scientists that are becoming frustrated with the lack of attention and care that's devoted to our um, seed eaters going, going, just disappearing, right? Um, persons have been using mist nets to trap hundreds of birds at a time. Okay, um, some of these people, uh, our naturalists, they thought that, hey, this practice is unsustainable. And that needed to be stopped immediately if there was any, if, if there was to have any kind of hope for the birds to, to maintain a stable population, right? This article warns that the trade in songbirds is about to begin, right? This is an illegal trade coming in from South America. This was from before I was born. And here I am talking to you about the same thing. So the books mention the trapping of songbirds, right? And you know, this is a practice that's been happening not only here, but around the world. Okay, so what really makes our situation here unique? Why are we making such a huge fuss about it? Okay, well, the fact that we're an island, are we not a continent, right? We are a very small space. That makes a damaging effect even more damaging. So things like human settlement, hunting, trapping, they tend to have a much more detrimental effect on an island as opposed to on a continent. But we need to question ourselves, right? Men especially, right? This is a male-dominated hobby. What is it? What is it that draws you to holding a bird in a cage? Something that was free that you now take for yourself. There's something that really, really draws you to that. What is it? Could be songbird competitions, right? I'm certain many of you would already know that there are these competitions where male birds, even though they've been singing for millennia, they have to be trained to sing by men, right? Big prize money is at stake for the man and not for the bird, obviously, all right? Um, but there's also something that's, that's been brewing, right? There's also something that's been going on and something that 
um, we've been hearing, right? Uh, almost every keeper of birds that I've spoken to, he said, boy, is he spraying, you know? Is he spraying, right? So I wanted to know for myself exactly what was sprayed and what the effects of these chemicals were. So we got some research, um, some rigorous research conducted. Uh, we found that at least 51 types of insecticides, herbicides and fungicides were used in the sugarcane and rice fields. Uh, several of these could be very toxic to birds in very high doses. So it will take a lot of the poison to be toxic. But there were three categories of chemical which were very documented, very well documented to be lethal to birds at low doses. And these are organochlorines, organophosphates, and carbamates. And some of these, like the carbamates, they were so deadly that a single seed size capsule would be enough to kill a small bird. So we understand and accept that harmful chemicals were sprayed over the cane and rice fields for many years. Uh, this action surely would have led to widespread poisoning of not only birds, but of countless other creatures as well. The question must be asked, however, what about the other seed-eating birds that did not possess such a musical a song? Because they remain present to this day. They eat the same things, right? They occupy the same habitat. The only difference was that they did not have that musical song. Right. Furthermore, the seed eaters were not limited to the cane and the rice fields. They were also found in other habitats which, which were not sprayed for any reason, like the large billed seed finch that's now definitely not here anymore. All right. That was a bird of forest and forest edge. Okay, This is not a bird that frequented grasslands or frequented the cane fields or the rice fields. All right. Remember, nine species of seed eaters native to this country are either, either no longer found here or extremely rare. And they're all known for their song. And here we have three other seed eating birds occupying the same ecological niche as their musical counterparts, yet they remain common. All right, so I'll just take you back a little bit. According to the ornithological records in Trinidad and Tobago, there was a marked decline in certain species. So we had the large bill seed finch and the others. Then the, then the gray seed eater decided to decline. And then when the gray seed eater was almost gone, the ruddy breasted seed eater was targeted. All right. I happened to meet a man a few weeks ago um, with a ruddy breasted seed eater in a cage. And I was out birding in Pinal, right, in South Trinidad. And he pointed to the marsh, to the marsh there, not to the marsh, there was no marsh there. Um, he pointed to the marsh and, and said, you know, we used to catch robins by the hundreds with nets long time, but now they have none. And, I'm, and he's holding the bird and he's looking at the empty, empty piece of habitat. And it seems that the link was not forthcoming. So we have to ask ourselves, without the native seed eaters present and only the grass quits holding the fort in the various habitats, what's happening? Well, I was scrolling in the wrong place. Sorry about that. I gave you a free sneak peek. So yeah, we got some, uh, a problem here. Yeah, the, the, the death of native seed eaters has left a, a, vape, a gaping hole, right? Um, I'm getting mixed up in my notes. A gaping hole, um, what is really a vacant ecological niche that's waiting to be exploited, All right? So these three species have had varying levels of success here with the common wax bill on the left, uh, spreading the quickest. And this bird can actually now be found across several areas of Central and South Trinidad. And it's also um, been found on Tobago. And the scene of these species is that they're very hardy, they're almost virulent. And they tend to outcompete native species for resources in terms of food and territory. But what about bringing back local birds? Now, there are three main hurdles that we must overcome if we have to reinstate our native seed eaters. We need to, first of all, protect, preserve, and in most cases, actively restore their habitat. This involves a decrease in deforestation. Right? We need to be mindful of pollutants. We need to be mindful of our use of chemicals for agriculture as well as in the home and so on. 
All right, habitat degradation happens everywhere and damaging behaviors are almost socially acceptable. For example, when last you went to a mechanic and you didn't see them dumping the old oil in the drain, where does it go from there? All right. Uh, we also need to humanely manage a threat of invasive species. I have another story for you. Back in 2012, I found a small population of house sparrows at one of our industrial ports. Forestry Division assisted in the capture and euthanasia of most of these birds. And as horrifying as it sounds, it's a necessary step in ensuring that we don't repeat the mistakes made elsewhere. So for anyone who's ever visited New York City, for example, and you've seen the thousands of house sparrows there, guess what? House sparrows are invasive there as well. Yeah, um, that's an example of an unchecked invasive running completely wild. And lastly, and most importantly, we need to stop trapping our native seed eaters. I cannot stress on this enough, right? Look, if there's an insatiable need to trap birds, go and trap some invasives and do the country some good. What about breed and release? Uh, first of all, we need to determine the viability in terms of genetics. Are we investing in the current subspecies? Some birds, while they may look alike, uh, they can be genetically separate. We also need to properly evaluate the ecosystem carrying capacity before any release can take place. All bush and the same bush. There are also several challenges that we need to be prepared for if we're breeding birds that are to be released in the wild. We have to be careful about uh, human imprinting, for example, right, on the birds. Right, we need to um, we need to ensure that they can um, fear humans as adults. Right, they need to be able to know um, where to find food. Uh, they need to know how to attract a mate and escape predators. Right, basic needs and necessities for their life, and they have to be well equipped for it. Um, but the entire situation of a breed and release program, or maybe wildlife farming in general. It's a complicated scene. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about this. So in the looking at the criteria for wildlife farming, right? Um, this is a matrix here we have to really properly evaluate because the breeding of songbirds can potentially solve a lot of our problems, but only if it meets the criteria outlined here. How this diagram works is if the answer to any of these questions turns out to be false, then the breeding or farming of wildlife would be ill-advised. You see, we need to meet the demand without stressing the ecosystem. It's all a balance, knowing well that this is a far from ideal situation. But let's look at the questions as they apply to our situation here. Firstly, do captive bred birds form a substitute for wild caught birds? This is like, does the breeding program encourage people to go and seek birds through the program? Or does it encourage people to search for wild caught? Right, because think about it, if you have a breeding program and you have some, some person will just be like, yeah, well, you get yours from the breeding program, well, I get a wild one. And then suddenly the wild one becomes better. And, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go well from there. Second question, is the demand for the birds going to increase with the breeding program? If there's an increase in the demand, then the breeding program is not advised at all. Is a breed and release program going to be cost efficient? As in, is it going to be cheaper to source a wild bird? Right, we have to ask ourselves these questions. This has been the main stumbling block in the breeding program thus far. A lot of costs need to be funneled into the actual program. Uh, what about restocking from the wild? Is there going to be restocking from the wild? We don't want people to go trapping birds for the breeding program from the wild. Right? That doesn't make any sense. We have to stop the removal of wild birds altogether. And lastly, I know a lot of you all must be looking at this and giggling, right? Laundering. Laundering of wildlife, right? We know Tricky Daddy and how we just be, right? Um, laundering of wildlife involves falsifying the origin of the animal, right? So it's like somebody saying that a wild caught animal was bred in captivity. So let me elaborate on this a little bit using an example from the mainland, right? A lot of people claim that Brazil has a viable breeding program. However, 
there's a lot of evidence to indicate that there are some flaws in the program. You see, bird rings are issued um, to registered breeders by mail. So persons would request the rings, the rings would be sent to them, and that was the end of the story. The issues encountered here involved tampering of the rings and entirely counterfeit rings altogether. But authorities suspected that there was something else going on. So they started Operation Delivery, and that involved hand delivering the rings instead of mailing them, right? So the handed delivery was to take place once an on-site inspection happened. And guess what? For some ring sizes, there was an, a reduction in requests by up to 97%. And this is highly indicative of people being unwilling to have the authorities visit and see their operations, right? Perhaps their operations were not necessarily meeting the guidelines for best practices. Perhaps they had something to hide. Your guess is as good as mine. Moving on, let me just uh, get, get another water break. Mm, stay hydrated, everyone. Conservation of Wildlife Act for Trinidad and Tobago, we're looking at it here. And this states that, paraphrasing, no person should buy, sell, offer for sale, expose for sale, any caged bird during the closed season. Furthermore, anyone who has a caged bird must also process, possess a permit that's issued by the chief game warden. And the current laws, as we can see here, do not speak to the welfare of the birds themselves. All right? Maybe the system could be improved for uh, you know, to be more friendly to, to responsible keepers. Now, it must be said that all laws are useless without enforcement. We need to patrol the, for the habitat for illegal trapping, right? We need to patrol the various ports of entry, and as I'm talking about the official ports and the unofficial ports, right? We, we really need to, to patrol these areas, right? We need, to, we need to have our eyes out there, right? Without a doubt, we have a lot of work to do. The current cage standards that we have here, they're too small, right? But incremental increases in size requirements per bird are only going to encourage overcrowding. Now, according to the law, um, this is another point that these seed eaters, right? They could be legally traded during the open season. But if you know now, right, the status of all of these species of seed eaters, right, we know that most of them, right, six out of the nine are entirely extirpated, right? Um, and one other just is very, very rare. And then the other two are also pretty rare, right? They're gone. So if you're allowing the trade in birds, where do you think the birds are coming from? right? They just magically appear in somewhere, right? The, the legislation here is effectively facilitating the trafficking of wildlife by allowing the trade, right? Because this is a major legal loophole that needs to be closed. We need a highly regulated ethical system. Now let's talk a little bit about science, all right? Because we have to deal in facts in this day and age of misinformation, okay? You see, science needs to inform all aspects of management, both at the species level, as well as at the environmental level. Science tells us which birds need more protection, which birds need the breeding program the most, and which areas need to be protected. Science answers our questions about the remaining populations, not the man down the road who say it have a million birds there. Science tells us about the current capacity of the ecosystem to support the populations and they know how best to restore natural habitats so that future populations of seed eaters can thrive. Local law says that our bullfinch, which by the way, and sorry to burst your bubble, isn't actually a real bullfinch, right? A bullfinch is a bird that's from Northern Europe across the Atlantic, right? But anyway, um, our bullfinch, according to local law, is unique because it has a bigger beak, it's a bigger bird, and it has a different song dialect. All right. Let me tell you that the dialect part is likely true, as we discussed previously with local uh, dialects in different places, right? But let me also tell you that there are two subspecies of the chestnut-bellied seed finch, 
and the larger of the two subspecies is found in Central South America, and the smaller subspecies is found in Northern South America and Trinidad and Tobago. Science. So the next time someone tries to charge some, some exorbitant price for a larger build bullfinch, claiming that that's the original local bird, now you know that it's definitely a traffic bird. Information can protect you and your wallet. Some people say that you can find these birds still in a deep bush here and there, right? Whether it's Moruga or Toko or wherever. For those of you with this knowledge, please take me there and show me the birds so that we could amend our records, right? We had to be together in this because we all enjoy the birds, right? Science can help also through deliberate monitoring of any released birds. Have they adjusted to life in the wild? Uh, were they able to feed themselves, etc.? Okay, we're almost done, guys. I promise. Right? But this is perhaps the most crucial part of my little presentation here. You see, if we change our mindset, then we can train, we can change how we treat one another, right? And this includes animals. We most importantly. We need to begin to empathize, to see things from the bird's perspective, right? What is their life like? First and foremost, we have to remove the price tag on the birds, right? Oh gosh, how many donkey years have we felt some sense of entitlement to control nature and life? History has proven time and time again that once you ascribe a dollar value on, to, like, on a life, that opens the door for exploitation and horrendously unethical practices, right? And this goes all the way back to the mass enslavement of human populations, to the keeping of cetaceans in tanks, to industrialized farming. If we take profit out of the equation altogether, where's the motivation to override the rights of something else? Where is it? You take the, the, the profit out of it. Is there motivation? Is it if you have nothing monetary to gain out of exploiting something else, would you still do it? Think about it, right? Um, you know, and some people are coming to the realization that birds have rights. Ooh, can you believe it? Look at that. I quote a ruling by the Delhi High Court in 2015 uh, regarding the trade in birds. And I quote, this court is of the view that running the trade of birds is in violation of the rights of the birds. They deserve sympathy. Nobody is caring as to whether they have inflicted, they have been, sorry, inflicted cruelty or not, despite a settled law that birds have a fundamental right to fly and cannot be caged and will have to be set free in the sky. End quote. For my friends who keep birds in cages, I have a few questions for you, all right? Do you think your birds enjoy their lives? Do your birds sing out of happiness? Do you think that they have a right to enjoy their lives? And do you love them? Think about these things for a little bit, all right? With those thoughts, let me end here. And um, thank you all for listening, right? Huge appreciation to the folks at Nature Nature for facilitating this webinar. And I do hope that this can stir some changes in our attitudes towards caged birds, towards wild birds, towards each other. All right, um, special thanks. Before I end to uh, Ben Mirren, right? Thank you, Ben, for the bird song compilation. Mishak Peer, thank you for your ethnographic photography of songbird races in Guyana. Thank you, Nigel Lal Singh, for your photos of songbirds and introduced species. Thank you, Darshan Narang, for your photos of scientists in the field. And thank you, Donella Jadu, for your ethnographic photography of a songbird competition in Trinidad. So please feel free to ask me any questions. If I don't get to your question here, you can always catch up with me on social media. I'd love to hear from you. So back to you, Lauren. All right, thank you so much for us. And thank you everyone for being with us today. Now we already have some questions coming in both in the Q&A and on Facebook. 
So let's start with that. So our first question is, do you know if anyone has documented indigenous or native ornithological knowledge? Indigenous or, um, I got a book on the significance of, of birds to, to, the, to the first peoples, but that was not really in line with like the scientific records. So I think, I think as far back as it goes, I think it would be in the 1800s with uh, Taylor and Ligato, as far as I know. All right. And we have another question. Can you tell us a bit more about the house sparrows? Have there been additional reports of house sparrows? Do we know where these birds are coming from? Yeah, so there, there, there are a few house sparrows that are still living um, at the port. Um, the last time I checked, which was a few years ago, but um, as, as, as much as we try to get rid of the, the house sparrows, um, they, they keep coming. Uh, what they come on is, is the ships, right? So they eat, they eat their very, very versatile birds and um, they tend to survive and they breed. I think house sparrows can breed up to maybe six times a year or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I, they, I'm not sure if they're still around, but some, a, a few, a few uh, couples may be still, still present and escaping our eyes. All right, thank you. And um, a question from Facebook, wondering if the introduction of birds from other countries spread disease locally. And well, I can say that the answer to that one is in fact, yes. Uh, doing background research for this presentation, we found that there was a paper published by local medical professionals in 2019, describing the first case of pox viral infection in illegally imported lesser seed finches, large billed seed finches and gray seed eaters. So yes, we are in fact um, getting imported diseases with imported birds that do not go through proper quarantine processes. Uh, we also have a question in the chat about the saffron finch. For us. Yeah, well, the saffron finch is um, like it's, it's heavily trafficked in Brazil, um, but I'm not sure how popular it is as a cage bird here. I know some people keep it. Uh, I think they call it can canary or Trinidad canary. Um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty um, still numerous, especially in suburban areas. We have a question. Um, uh, here's a question. You can see uh, that's just a general generalized question. But could bullfinches that have been trafficked to Trinidad be rehabilitated and released in Trinidad, or would we have to take them back? Um, hmm. That would uh, that would require a level of uh, scientific research in terms of the genetics. So we need to understand what our gene pool is and what, um, what part this bird would be, whether it's the same variant, well, the same breed of bullfinch, the same subspecies. Um, there's a lot of genetic uh, confusion in terms of taxonomy, in terms of uh, that, this big question. So it would need some level of scientific research into the genetics for us can go into <laughs> that one a bit in terms of uh, where these birds are from, whether they're from here, whether they're from Brazil, but, uh, birds can be rehabilitated, um, captive birds can be re rehabilitated and assessed for release if um, they meet certain standards. If they are too um, imprinted on humans, if they will only ever come back to humans for feeding, this may, be, this may pose a problem. Um, but, you know, this is a kind of a question that leads to lots of more questions that really requires a lot more research. So it's still, it's possible they could be released in rehabbed and released, but you know, we're kind of early stages. And um, well, we have two questions that kind of tie into each other. The first of which is someone saying that they've seen a lot of cockatiels and budgies being sold on Facebook. And they want to know if that's legal and what we can do when we see those posts. Now, cockatiels and budgies 
to my knowledge, are actually legal, but people do post a lot of animals that aren't on Facebook and even in WhatsApp groups, etc. cetera. Um, but when you see those posts, you can report them to the forestry division. Um, in terms of the cockatiels and budgies, those are considered domestic species. And so they do not, um, they are not offered protections under the Conservation of Wildlife Act. Um, and those are legal sales. Um, so I believe that would also include canaries as well. Yeah, it, does, it includes canaries. Uh, birds you want to be on the lookout for would be things like macaws. Like, you know, I think we've all heard about the recent bird heist at the Wildfowl Trust, and they're still looking for those macaws. Um, but yeah, that macaws are protected. Many other birds are protected as well. And someone else was also asking, can stricter penalties be implemented? Uh, well, that does tie back to some of the stuff that Franz was saying in the presentation, where we do need to change the laws uh, to account more for animal welfare and to really crack down on some of these unethical practices. But that's a process. And someone's asking, in the same way that Blue and Yellow Macaws were successfully in, um, I want the chat changed. Yeah, in the same way that Blue and Yellow Macaws were successfully reestablished in Trinidad, do you see this success transferring to song birds? What do you think for us? Um, it's only possible if, um, if we stop people from trapping them because like, uh, for example, some of the songbirds that appear here uh, on migration, so like the lessons and the lion seed eaters, they would show up here um, sporadically. And I remember one time when, you know, like they would show for maybe a, a week or two and then they would, they would go back to South America and they would trap us out. So once, you know, because the males, when they, when they come here, they sing, right? That's what they do. They sing. And once anyone hears that, they'd be like, hey, it have birds singing there. But I'm, bam, I'm like six man roll up in a van and they have the traps and they set it out and they'll just wait for that bird. So that behavior needs to stop, right? When we see things as a people, we have to know how to leave things alone and let them be. And that's the only way that any kind of program would be would be successful. We have a um, question. Um, what are the legalities associated with misnet trapping? That I'm not sure. I'm not sure because all I know is of that um, article from 1984. And I honestly don't know if um, anything was put in the legislation regarding the misnets in particular. Yeah, that's something we can definitely look into, get some more detail on that. Yes, um, I, can't, I don't recall Miss Nets um, in particular being mentioned in the Conservation of Wildlife Act, uh, though, for example, under the act, you cannot use lime to trap birds anymore, which uh, was uh, traditionally used um, and is quite horrific. The birds essentially get, it's a sticky trap. Um, and so the birds are caught this way and can, injure themselves and harm themselves and it's not target specific target species specific so it's a ter it's a pretty awful uh, tool that was previously used um that is not allowed where the mist nets are included i'm not sure i'll just chime in having probably spent the most time staring at, at the texts and the, the changes uh, this is mark gibson uh, no the mist nets is not specifically mentioned um uh, the actual trapping methods are also not um, specified either other than to say yeah like you like you said no bird lime or the the sticky glue um, but in theory there's it's it's an unregulated area um, because as as we all know any permitted hunting uh, in this country would not carry with it bag limits so um, we, have, we have someone in the chat saying that mist nets are illegal so we okay will... yeah oh, yeah Richard Thurler would probably know. Yes. Right. So it wouldn't be written in any regulation. This would be then the discretionary um, policy, which is exactly where it needs to be. All right, cool. Glad that we got some information on that. And we've got another question. So yes, uh, uh, we have uh, Richard Cirillo is a game warden who has provided this information to us. So it is definitely correct. Miss Nets are illegal. 
Thank you. All right. So next question. Um, from only casual observations, the grassland yellow finches seem to be increasing both in numbers and habitats. Are you aware of any attempts to study these currently? Um, not at the moment. Um, I know that there have been a couple new... Um, when was the last site? I can't remember when was the last report that we got of, of the grassland yellow finches, but I think we have to we have to go out and, and find them. I know that they they I know that they were expanding, but I'm not sure of any like um, specific effort to study them in particular. Okay. Yeah, uh, one question. Um, do you think spreading awareness of humans negative impacts should be highlighted? I think that because the evidence of their behavior is not directly seen. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, people need to know. Um, I think we know how we behave. But it's like, for example, um, what people say, well, you have this, this so-and-so has this animal and so-and-so has that animal and things might be socially acceptable because we don't know. So we know, we know how we are, but what we need to really um, make, make public and make uh, more people aware of is our impact, you know, like how does it, how are our actions, because we view our actions in a certain way, um, how are our actions viewed from who we do our actions onto? Right, so how is it from the bird's perspective? How is it from the animal's perspective? You know, um, that is what we have to really um, put out there, I believe. I think that that's something that's missing. Well, almost a follow-up question to that. Uh, do you see any change in attitudes? More young people are getting into hobbies like birding. Is this leading to changes in attitude and behavior? For example, I don't know anyone my age who keeps songbirds, but I might have a biased sample. Birding in this context seems to be referring to bird watching, uh, which is the context in which most of the world uses it. Although sometimes in Trinidad and Tobago, birding is aptly used to talk about keeping them in cages. Yeah, that's that's um, hilarious actually. Like they literally the entire world uh, views birding as the enjoyment of wild birds in their natural habitat. But here in Trinidad, we have uh, a birding federation that is dedicated towards the incarceration of birds. Um, we've had, I, I would say that there has been um, an increase in people who are environmentally conscious and people who are a little bit more um, aware of what's going on, right? Whereas like we would have become more disconnected in a sense because we're all on a device, we're all using the internet, for example, right now. Um, but I would say that the, the spread of information on the internet has also helped, you know, like it was, it took me years as a, uh, as a, as a little boy to see a footage of, let's just say a blue wheel, right? But now it's so easy, it's so accessible that more people can see it and more people can um, appreciate it, right? Um, of course, the, the whole, uh, the climate emergency that we're living in right now, I think a lot more people are becoming aware because we're starting to see the effects of it um, also right in front of us. Um, so yeah, I would say that there they are, more people are being made aware, right? I have seen young people with songbirds in cages already, right? Um, so it's still present, but um, I would still say that not enough people are aware, right? Because out of the set of people who are aware, then you would have the subset of people who would be motivated to do something about it. And then from that, then you have a further subset of people who are not only motivated to do something, but those who actually get up and do. And that's the section of the population that you want to increase as much as, po as, much as possible. The section of people who actually get up and get, you know? All right, thank you. And another question. Is there a decline of the population of the blue-gray tanager? I also casually observe that they are less in my area. They could be moving around. Um, the blue-gray tanagers tend to move um, according to fruiting trees and nesting availability as many other birds. So they may have been reliant on a tree that was fruiting um, 
in your area that you may have been aware of and that tree may have uh, been cut down or something like that and they may have had to uh, they may be forced to move and go somewhere somewhere else right but i haven't really noticed um any any particular decline in that species right actually at home by me i find that they've increased in number so that could also be due to them moving out from someone else's area so um, but generally they they tend to be um pretty stable all right awesome um i actually think that might be it for questions if anyone has any more questions that they would like to ask now's the time but otherwise you can feel free to contact nature nature or contact for us yeah i just want to say um i saw mr mcfarlane in, in the chat um Thank you. I just want to thank you, Mr. McFarlane, for your help in the house sparrow situation. Um, he was a, he was a guy who was very instrumental back in the day um, for us controlling those um, house sparrows. It's been a while, Mr. McFarlane. You know, so good to see you here. And uh, oh, we've gotten another question. Euphonias are sometimes kept in captivity. Is there trade in these birds as well? Yeah, I would say that, that there is a trade in, in euphonias, um, but it's a lot less than the, um, than the seed eaters, because I think most of the euphonias here may be still um, be birds that, that are trapped here, as opposed to birds that are brought from the mainland. Um, but I think what saved the, the violaceous euphonia, uh, as well as the Trinidad euphonia, is that they, they occupy a wide range of habitats. So, you know, in addition to them being found in, you know, in, in lowland forest, they're also found in, in high elevation and very inaccessible places in the country. But I'm not sure of, um, of a, an active trade. Uh, we have someone um, in the Q&A just, uh, this is a nice mention. They're urgently pleading with the audience to please contribute to citizen science and scientific reports as we do not have proper bird counts and that everyone should download iNaturalist on their phones and use it. it definitely uh, iNaturalist has a fantastic feature where you can um, actually end up with if your observation is uh, accredited to a certain degree, it is considered scientific research and is used as scientific data. This is really, really useful for local and international uh, birding and other uh, uh, research. And so, yes, definitely everyone should have iNaturalist and uh, work towards getting um, a more robust data set of what birds we have in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, I also um, just want to just want to make a plug and just say also um, eBird from Cornell Lab is another, yeah. is another um, excellent app that you can you can have and you can contribute to citizen science that way. And I'm making myself available. If you see a bird and you don't know what it is, um, contact me and uh, you know send me a picture or a description or something or audio recording whatever it is, and you know I'll I'll try to help as best as I can. All right, great. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it for questions. Uh, oh, we have one on Facebook. What impact have feral cats made on local bird populations? Oh boy. Um, okay, so hmm. I wouldn't. It's difficult to say um, in terms of like an island-wide situation, but I know of particular areas so for example we have a problem now with Arnos Field in Tobago with some with some cats that have been seen in the in the neighborhood and the first first uh, birds that they, they took out were the night jars so the night jars like to come and sit on the road at night and they sleep during the day and they're they're pretty uh, easy prey for the cats right um we have a whole bunch of cats at Carony bird sanctuary right some people call it Carony cat sanctuary I didn't know, right? Um, but there are like upwards of 50 cats there. Um, they took out and the cats, I believe, were responsible for the owls. We had some tropical screech owls that were nesting there. And wood rails and all of these other birds that like to, to stay low down, especially in the mangrove. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been documented worldwide 
that cats outdoor cats and this is not only strays that is are people who own cats and they have cats um, at home and they let them go at night or, or during the day or whatever they be like oh well you want to go outside so uh, let them go outside and the cat oh he's bringing on bird and snake and things sometimes but he don't kill nothing well you know that's that's what cats do they're built to kill and any environment that they're in um they're going to they're going to cause a lot of a lot of harm, right? The best way to have a cat, if you have a cat, is is to keep the cat indoors, like I do, right? I have mine right next to me, right? Come here, go on the internet, go on the internet. There we go, right? So indoor cats. They've also shown um, that indoor cats or indoor outdoor cats, I should say, that experience um, more play. So if you actually get them toys, um, you know, those sticks with elastic and feathers and stuff on them that they play with, that also does dramatically uh, decrease their uh, hunting, um, you know, their desire to go hunting outside. The hunting drive, yeah. Just play with your cat, it helps. Yes. And, but and if you feel bad about you know keeping your cat indoors forever and you have the option, you can always do a catio. They're super cute. Just like yeah. a little patio that's sort of screened off for your kitties. Yeah, we take ours outside, but we always uh, stay with him. So if he's outside in a place, like I used to carry him in the park and we used to walk through the park together, but he's always with me and always supervised. So it's just a, a matter of being a responsible cat owner. Right. Um, but yeah, to answer the question, uh, there, there hasn't been any definitive evidence for the impact of cats on the birds population in Trinidad and Tobago, but there have been many um, cases, localized cases um, of that. All right. Every time I say that's it for questions, there's always another question. So I'm giving you guys a few seconds in case there are any more. But I do think maybe this is like, this is it for now. But yeah, again, if you have anything else that you want to ask about or chat about, feel free to reach out to Nature Nature or directly to for us. Definitely. And, and thank you guys so much for coming today. We really appreciated you being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Faraz. Thanks, Lauren and Neve. Great job. Cheers. All right. Nice. I think we can just wrap it here then. Yeah, goodbye, everyone, and have a great evening. All right. Take care. <laughs>